Hello, this is an introduction to sensors and data acquisition for an upcoming laboratory for ME144L uh, where we will experiment with a uh, compound pendulum setup. After I uh, describe the, uh, the lab setup, I'll then talk about some sensing principles, then data acquisition, and then close with uh, modeling and experimentation discussion uh, before uh, giving a summary. For each of these three areas, I'll, um, there's also a pre-lab, and I'll discuss them within these uh, lecture slides. So this uh, compound pendulum setup uh, uh, has just an aluminum uh, compound, compound pendulum that's, that is attached rigidly to this shaft that rotates uh, on some on some uh, on some bearings that are fixed to this uh, to the table there's there's an angular potentiometer a precision potentiometer that's providing us with a measurement of the angle of uh, that that this pendulum will oscillate at so uh, what we're going to do in the lab is uh, provide an opportunity for you to uh, use a simple sensor such as this hook, hook it up to um, some some DAC hardware and then use LabVIEW uh, to practice writing a program that will uh, that will collect some signals, allow you to do some signal analysis, and so on. the The nice thing about this uh, setup is we really know what to expect. We're re we will release typical experiment. We'll release this pendulum from rest and it'll oscillate until it stops. And uh, this shows, you know, this at least for this setup, uh, for this data, it only took about 20 seconds. Um, and the fact that it that it decays uh, indicates that the energy that we initially, you know, store into the system is being dissipated uh, by friction, uh, either in those bearings and in the pivot, uh, the attachment to the uh, sensor, uh, or or maybe even uh, some due to drag in the air. So. Uh, we'll try to determine which of these, uh, you know, uh, processes is dominant. Not necessarily in this lab, but uh, in, in the follow-up lab where we do a little bit more uh, on the modeling side. Okay. So here are the lab objectives. Um, this lab is intended to give an introduction to some basic sensors and using sensors, um, concept of signal conditioning, and becoming familiar familiar with with uh, uh, data acquisition hardware, and in this particular case, a National Instruments MyDAC device. Uh, we'll continue learning how to program in LabVIEW, and using LabVIEW also to uh, to acquire signals using the MyDAC device. We'll also talk a little bit about calibration. We want to calibrate that potentiometer for angular measurement, and uh, and then also uh, write programs to analyze signals possibly within the uh, LabVIEW environment. Um, we uh, also want to provide a real simple example where you can write a, a program that uh, collects that data and saves it for later processing if you want to do that. So um, finally, we want to use that measured data to answer questions about the system. In particular, you know, we, we can try to um, measure different types of system parameters. And what I want to discuss in this case is how we can use that to estimate the uh, mass moment of inertia. And that'll be up in this in the in the coming discussion. So now a little bit about about sensors and sensing. Uh, most modern sensors nowadays are uh, electromechanical, and that means, of course, that the uh, the sensing mechanism that's involved converts some detection of a variable in and in general we could say mechanical, but of course we we mean in any kind of energy domain uh, into um, a detectable electrical quantity of some type. So we'll call that electromechanical. Uh, we can then classify sensing mechanisms as being uh, either resistive, and some examples are like the potentiometer that we're using uh, this week, but also we'll later talk about strain gauges and uh, uh, also, thermistors, that, which you might be familiar with, are a type of sensor that's also resistive. And what that means is, is um, a change in the uh, temperature uh, influences resistance. And from that, and this just shows a little example of a thermistor, you can detect that temperature change uh, by virtue of, of measuring the resistance uh, across that device. 
a lot of photo type photosensitive resistors also are sorry a lot of photo conductive resistors they are also uh, resistive in nature um, there's also capacitive type sensors uh, some some uh, physical phenomena is changing say the relative capacitance of the device and some many different types of microelectromechanical devices actuators the little stud sensors that you might see uh, hardware stores and so on those are capacitive and and by by uh, running these across the uh, a wall for example you're changing the capacitance that can be detected and so those are capacitive type sensors inductive sensors those uh, take advantage of changes in in the uh, in a magnetic in a magnetic type quantity, for example, we'll call it the inductance or reluctance of the device. And then there's also a piezoelectric. And, and as in upcoming labs, we we may have different types of sensors that pop up, and we'll revisit this classification and discuss more about these. We're going to talk a little bit about a resistive sensor in this case, which is the uh, potentiometer. And um, as we know from basic physics class, we uh, uh, a simple conductor. Uh, if we if we look at the if we measure resistance across the uh, the ends of this type of this conductor, so you have a uniform area, the the material has some resistivity, rho and some length. We know that we we've seen that uh, the resistance uh, is is related to those those properties of of that uh, element this way. So like and and it's, it's helpful to see that. The resistance depends on on a material property. This rho is a res the resistivity, and also depends on geometry. And this is very common in all kinds of sensors. So, like capacitance, similarly, you would have a material type property and also geometry. So that's something to remember. That's helpful when you're looking to see how a sensor can be made by changing any of those properties. In this case, for example, if you change the length, you get a different resistance, and you can detect that resistance change and so on. Or the resistivity changes again. You have a sensor that can detect uh, um, uh, that can detect something that might be influencing that that resistivity change right so like a thermistors might work that way right they influence a change in resistivity and thus you can detect the uh, the temperature by virtue of its relationship to resistivity or the other way around the resistivity's relation to temperature influence um, so again, one way that we can then use these as sensors is we can either directly measure the resistance, uh, for example, with an ohmmeter, or more, more often than not, we might infer that that change is occurring by using a signal conditioning circuit. And, and a very common and then simplest way is to, is to use a, a voltage divider circuit. And let me show you how that looks. So again, the simplest type of, of signal conditioning, uh, commonly used for resistive sensors, um, is just to is just to put that resistor now that sensor now is a resistor in a circuit you might ground one side so you have two potential differences uh, one might be the ground and the other might be a uh, um, uh, fixed voltage and then what you uh, can do is uh, is 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 when it, either r1 here or r2 would be uh, the sensor as one of those changes obviously the voltage out so what you're doing then is changing that that sensor into instead of requiring a measurement of resistance you're requiring or allowing rather the vo a, a measurement of voltage and this is this is often you know, more advantageous for us because we have devices that measure voltage uh, rather than resistance okay so the potentiometer is is uh, basically a potentiometric sensor and the basic configuration this is one way that you know that you could use. This is a rotational potentiometer. There's also many uh, other types of potentiometers. There's a linear potentiometer. So instead of having a mechanical input that would be rotational, you might have one that's uh, that's translational or you know linear, in the sense of motion, linear motion, rather than rotational. So, so you can see you again have have two potentials. Uh, in this case, showing the plus five volts and minus five volts. And then when this when when the swipe uh, the, the the tap on this resistor is centered, for example, you'd have right a, um, a zero voltage in this case. And um, as as the uh, mechanical input changes, you, you could detect that change. So this just shows what we try to do in a calibration then is to relate 
oh, that positional input, so you, you would put in a known mechanical input, in this case, for example, theta, measure the output voltage, and you see you'd measure the voltage between this, uh, the, the terminal connection, uh, relative, in this case, to ground, for example. And when we build the calibration, what we want is, is, to, is to then build a relationship that tells us, oh, that position is now related to some voltage output. And, you know, we would try to show what the relationship is. And this shows a linear relationship. It doesn't have to be linear, but this shows that uh, you would have some kind of linear relationship between position and, and voltage. By the way, with some potentiometers, you, if you ever buy one for this purpose, make sure that you get a, one that's called a linear, that has a linear taper. A lot of potentiometers are, are used for uh, audio purposes, so you might have an audio taper, so you wouldn't necessarily get a linear relationship this way between, say, the position and, and, the, uh, and the resistance because it's designed for a different purpose. So make sure you get a linear taper if you're going to use this for positional measurements. And one of the reasons we like linear sensors is because you, 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 uh, you, you can then directly relate the position, say, that you're measuring to the voltage that you're measuring. And uh, if it's linear related, then the trends that you would see in the voltage are directly related to the trends that you would see. And just looking at the signal, you, you it tells you something about the variation. Um, it, it's tolerable to have a nonlinear sensor, but then you, you just need to pass it through some kind of function. And again, being able to just at a glance look at the signal um, and see that uh, what the trend looks like. Um, that would be changed by the, the functional relationship between the actual position and the voltage. Okay, so that's all this is talking about. L linear sensors are nice because you only need one K, one calibration coefficient. Sometimes you might have a, a y-intercept. Sometimes we try to make that go to zero. It's just convenient, but uh, it's not in, and this is, has a note about that. It's not, not uh, critical. So first pre-lab question that I put together is I just, we just want to make sure that when you walk into the lab, you're going to be doing a you know, hands-on lab, so we're going to want you to hook up the sensor. We want, to, want you to make sure that you know how to connect the, the power, the input voltage, and know how to make a proper voltage measurement. And so by reviewing this basic sensing circuit that's on these slides, sketch that out, um, show how, you would, how those connections work, and also just describe using diagrams and basic relations with the voltage divider and so on, how your understanding of, of how this basic potentiometric circuit uh, gives you um, angular measurement. Again, the um, very straightforward, most of the discussion is here on these slides. Okay, so I'm going to discuss now a, a little bit about the uh, data acquisition um, that we'll be using uh, in this lab. And the the emphasis really in this in this course is on um, on on use of these devices and you know proper selection of them for a given application. Not so much on on how you would build these, for example, uh, and some of the fundamental principles that maybe might have been covered in a course that you took uh, in a, in a circuits class, like in your introductory mechatronics class, for example. Um, we uh, are now familiar that most but the fact that most modern voltage measurements are being made using analog to, to digital converters. Uh, you know, we're trying to get these information into a computer, so we wanted a digital form. The, there, you know, you might have seen in, in, in a circuits class or even physics class uh, analog voltage measurement devices, and actually we'll use one later in the lab as, as one as 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 a lab setup, but most of the devices, you know, digital multimeters, this DMM shown here. You know, these are all devices nowadays that typically have an analog to digital converter, you know, buried within uh, their their operating circuitry. Even though they can make resistance and voltage and current measurements, for example, there's really circuit, con uh, sorry, signal conditioning circuits here that you're switching between that allow you to make these, uh, uh, for example, parameter measurements or uh, current measurements. What you're really measuring fundamentally is, is, is voltage in here, and that's really the point of this slide. Um, you know, so um, general purpose uh, DAC devices, as we might call them, the, the type that we'll use in, in this course that you might actually insert into a desktop computer or it might actually be on a, on a larger chassis. Um, 
they also may have other types of of uh, of, of of hardware that are useful. So, in addition to what we might call analog input for measurement of voltage, you will have analog output vol uh, analog output functionality. This allows you to generate voltages. So, for example, you could generate a signal. Uh, it could function as it could it could it could function as a function generator. Um, they, they may also have digital input output line so in other words these these can only measure you know, digital levels so TTL type signals and so on these are very useful because sometimes you have certain sensors that that only require measurement of digital type signals and then also they might have some time these are just examples there may be other kinds of functions but timing circuits are also very helpful especially for example if you're trying to read say shaft speed a lot of times you're reading pulses and you to have a timer in there that can measure frequency effectively that's very useful so uh, sometimes these general purpose devices may have timing circuits on there those are always some things that when when you're trying to buy a DAC device you know uh, depending on what your application is check out each of the specs I've attached in an appendix the some of the specifications for the my deck and it's also a, uh, there's a link on the on the course uh, log for you to look at the uh, MyDAC specifications and you should be familiar with that. I'll uh, show some of them in the upcoming slides. And this is the MyDAC device. It's a small device. It's actually made for um, uh, educational type purposes, but you can use it for a lot of different uh, types of applications. The, there are um, these, these red and black connections actually allow it to be used almost like a digital multimeter. So these are for voltage and and resistance and current measures. Um, we typically don't use it for that in this course. Uh, along the side here um, is a terminal strip where you can access some of the analog in, analog out, and also the uh, digital I.O. Uh, connections to the MyDAC. Okay, and then there's also, as you can show with these phono plugs, there's also audio in and audio out connections that can be made. Uh, so these are um, another another um, analog uh, type input that you have and output in addition to the ones that that are on these terminal strips okay the um, this device is connected to your computer via a USB cable uh, which makes it convenient for you to use uh, with uh, your laptop uh, we're using them on desktops in the lab but you can easily connect this to to the uh, to your laptop and I think recently uh, National Instruments added functionality for these to be used also on a Mac platform, which makes it nice for uh, for a broader range of, uh, of users. Um, so, what should you know? What do I? What would I like for you to know about this data acquisition and A to D conversion for this course? There's some. I kind of like to split it up into general concepts and also kind of hardware specific. Meaning, you know, this is you know you all you need this for any kind of A to D application that you might have. And the hardware specific, you know, every setup that you might use from a general purpose board, you know, if you now move over to a microcontroller, there's always going to be different hardware specific uh, concepts. Uh, I'll discuss some of these. Uh, the nice thing about some of the National Instruments hardware is that the uh, you, you, you learn how to use this uh, NI Max, which is the Measurement Automation Explorer that gets uh, installed uh, when you install LabVIEW. Um, and this uh, program allows you to basically look at your data neighborhood if you like and it shows you what devices are connected everything from DAC devices to image acquisition devices if we're doing vision and so on remote devices if you have devices uh, on on the uh, on an ethernet connection so uh, the the max is a really nice way for you to test your connections and you'll use that quite a bit in the lab and uh, it also sometimes gives you a lot of guidance on how to connect signals to the right channels and so on. So some of that will be covered in the lab, and I won't talk too much about it in the lecture. But I do want to talk about these general principles uh, with regard to resolution and range and how fast to sample and you know, how many times to sample. Those are some things that, that uh, relate to, you know, I'm walking into the lab and I want to run an experiment for a specific purpose. These are some of the things that you have to think about that either when you're there, uh, taking the data, uh, especially if you're going to go away and analyze the data, if you haven't made good decisions, then the data can be use useless. So you want to make sure that you do these things uh, correctly. Um, one of the nice things about learning how to use some of this DAC hardware from, from National Instruments, again, there's a lot of different types of hardware, but uh, NI Instruments now are starting to be adopted very broadly. So what happens then is that 
and they start looking very familiar across different types of platforms and uh, so uh, a lot of people are starting to use similar types of software so by learning how to use it uh, NI hardware and software you it, it gives you some knowledge that that can be trans you know ported over into uh, to other types of technology but also uh, um, one of the nice things about NI um, hardware is once you learn how to use for example my DAC really making the transition to some of their more advanced uh, devices uh, make it, 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 it's a lot easier uh, to, to do that uh, so um, it, it's 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 uh, beneficial to understand how to use the my DAC. Um, uh, the the A to D converter again, as we said, it converts an analog voltage that you're putting in a terminal into into uh, in, into a digital form, and uh, that's the whole process. And and so we want to talk a little bit about about the influence on kind of the quantization in both in amplitude and in time. So the um, yeah, an A to D converter um, always is going to have a specification that you can look at on the spec sheets that's very important that talks about the full scale range. You know, there, there's only a certain range of voltage that can be measured and you don't want to exceed that. Either you, there, there's going to be a, a, a voltage level at, above which it will damage the device, but more, you know, but also, you know, it, it, it won't give you any information above a certain level. So you've got to, you've got to make sure that your voltage signals are within the measurable you know, or full-scale voltage range, as, as it's called. That also uh, couples in with the number of bits on the converter. You know, um, all these A to D converters are going to have a certain number of bits that it quantizes. So those two together tell you something also about the resolution um, of your signal. So and the resolution has to do with, you know, the, the, the quantization of the signal. So uh, you it, it allows you to discriminate between two different voltage levels. So a uh, uh, higher number of bits, obviously, you can slice up that voltage range more finely. Uh, if it's a lower bit converter, as I'll show you, then you, you, you lose the ability to distinguish between different voltage levels. Just to show you I kind of an excerpt here from the MyDAC, there's two, for the two different types of analog inputs, for the, for the, uh, the differential inputs, as, as, as we'll see, you can either run this on a plus or minus 10 volt range, so um, you can go lower than that. Also, you can have plus or minus two volt range. So you can you can adjust that in the in the measurement and automation score. And note that this is a DC coupled input. The audio input only has a range of plus or minus two volts, and that's AC coupled. So um, there's a difference between the type of signals that these two uh, inputs can uh, measure. Uh, DC coupled basically um, allows you to measure the full range of the signal um, uh, and it's not just that it measures you know DC but uh, it's directly coupled if you like um, and so let's say you had a signal where you were measuring from a force sensor and you had a, 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 a constant voltage signal detected from putting a weight on there and then it was also you know oscillating back and forth right so the DC coupled signal if you have the range would measure that that static value as well as the oscillation you want to make sure that it stays within the range the AC coupled is going to basically filter out that that fixed point that, that what we call the DC part it's going to and so the only part that you'll see is the oscillation okay now you don't get that without a cost uh, AC coupling means you stick a capacitor there in series with your signal and so there is some impedance if you like in the form of a capacitor that works really well then at high frequency so if your frequency if your signal is oscillating really high frequency that impedance turns out is very low but if you have a very low fluctuation and low frequency rather fluctuation then that, that impedance builds up it's bigger and you can lose some signal so AC coupling good at higher frequencies at lower frequencies you sometimes want to switch to DC coupled um, unfortunately sometimes you have signals that have this big DC part and you don't want to see that and you want to put that through the AC coupled obviously on the audio they put that through they have a, a an AC coupling there to eliminate any kind of DC uh, signal passing through there right it allows you to look at the higher frequency stuff that's uh, maybe more of interest in the audio signals that they're putting through there and a lot of detail there, but uh, just something for you to be aware of, for those of you interested. Um, as far as the, the the conversion levels, again, you have a here. This graph shows a, what the signal might look like in the computer if you have a 16-bit versus a 3-bit. Right, a 3-bit would be really a coarse 
uh, quantization of that signal. And note, the the 16-bit, you know, you might have a sine signal. It looks pretty nice and smooth because you've been able to slice it up. The 16-bit signal, the way you figure out what is the what is the delta there, here it is. The delta for a 16-bit signal is 0.15 millivolts for a full-scale range of 10 volts. If you had a 3-bit converter, that delta is 1.25 volts. So in other words, you, you can only tell the difference between you know 1.25 again really crude sometimes that's good enough I think it's really hard to find a 3-bit converter nowadays uh, even really low-cost microcontrollers have much better conversion than this This is a, an old figure but I just wanted to exaggerate what uh, the lower bit converter might look like compared to to high and you know you're gonna pay more for 16-bit even up to 24 higher bit converters if you like to 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 very um, uh, finally uh, chop up that signal. Again, so that gives you the resolution and the amplitude scale. And that's something that you should be aware of when you're uh, buying cert, uh, ADD converters, buying DAC equipment. Again, you're going to pay more for the high bit count. The other, the other critical thing is the scan rate. And this is how fast should I sample? And that's an important thing. And typically, you early on, you learn something about Nyquist. Um, remember the Nyquist? what's usually referred to as a Nyquist sampling theorem criteria is how it tells you a little bit about how what's the minimum that you should sample and everyone always throws out oh, you should you know twice you should measure twice the what 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 you're interested in well that's not really true I think you always want to go higher than that because you always want to at least capture what's in the signal and it's a very subtle thing and we don't have time to go into it but if you don't if, if you don't pay attention to all the content if you like in this in a signal and you don't capture at least you know two times above that then any signal that's in there that you miss right because it was a little higher than you thought is going to show up in that digitized form and you can never get that out and it corrupts your your signal so uh, this is something that's very subtle again it's more advanced you might learn about it if you ever take a course in in um, you know signal analysis signal processing uh, but to be to be clear, uh, always again sample as 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 fast as you can get away with. Um, it means that sometimes you're going to get a lot of data, but it makes sure that you uh, you don't corrupt your signal with uh, you know, with with a process called aliasing, which is uh, basically creating signals that uh, that that look like they're there, but they're not really there. They came in through the this uh, this uh, undersampling. Okay, so at, again, at, at least twice times at least two times rather the highest frequency that's present not that you're interested in okay so let's say you had a signal that had you knew had 60 hertz noise in there but you were only interested in 4 hertz motion you should still sample at at least two if not higher uh, 60 hertz so sample up, up above 150 hertz if you like that makes sure that you capture all of that noise as well and then you can digitally filter that out Okay. The alternative is, is to use analog filtering, and I don't want to get into that, but look up uh, something called anti-aliasing filters, and that'll tell you a little bit about how to prevent this whole, the whole issue here. Okay. Um, the other thing that Nyquist-based selection of sampling rates overlooks is that sometimes we're interested in the time resolution. And For example, in this particular experiment for the pendulum, we're actually interested more in, in time resolution. So I show this graph here to because it emphasizes that you know we want to measure the time period so we want to make sure that the time be that we have between points is more of a of what's going to drive our selection of a sample a, a delta t in our sample rate right so you know if we want to measure the period say here's t over 2 of a signal we want to make sure that we have enough points so that this error in finding that you know to say this is this, where it crosses zero is where we're going to determine to get half the period or even from here to here we want to make sure that that the error that we might have in measuring the period is is small for for our purposes right and we 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 would select some say some percentage of uh, the period, say we want it to be, you know, no, no bigger than 1%, okay? I'm going to throw some of that in the pre-lab for you to think about, okay? So, so time resolution is important in determining what your sample rate is, okay? Don't overlook that part. Another critical part in, in, in making connections, uh, and this is something that you'll practice in the lab, is is you have different kinds of grounds and this starts getting into some a lot of details and but you still have to be aware of them 
And I, I drew uh, three different grounds here. It's an old friend of mine, Double E, who taught me, and I never got out of my head. Uh, all grounds are not the same the world round. And uh, when a team member with more Double E experience than you draws out a certain kind of ground connection, they're not just uh, uh, doing this arbitrarily. It's just like as a, uh, you might have certain types of symbols that you use that mean very specific things. So uh, I kind of put them together here uh, for you to maybe look up. Um, but uh, you know, each of these has a specific designation. So you either have a circuit ground or com signal common, circuit or signal common. You have an earth ground and you have a chassis ground, and each of these has a special designation. I'm not going to draw the lines here for you. Let you figure that out. Okay. I pulled these figures actually out of some National Instruments. Um, this may actually ought to be out of the MyDAC uh, uh, spec pages, but it shows you that even the connections that you make um, either um, in, uh, on the analog out or on a, on a function generator, those sources, right, signal sources, so this, say this is an analog out from your MyDeck, that may also have a ground designation. And they're showing actually here a certain kind of ground. I'll tell you, that's not the kind of ground that I would use if I was saying, and this is a wording that I pulled out, this is a system ground. This is actually, I'm going to tell you, that's a chassis ground uh, symbol. And... Um, and, and this shows the two different types. You might have a grounded source where the ground side of your source is uh, grounded to, uh, in this case, say, an earth ground. Uh, maybe they're just using that as a chassis ground, but then they're saying, as example, you could also put that to the earth ground. Uh, I'll give them that. But uh, um, there's also the chance that I might have copied that incorrectly. Uh, but uh, be aware that this is the chassis ground designation, um, not the earth ground. And and and. Just uh, the main point here is that there's two different types of ground source and then there's a the floating source. In the floating source, uh, you, you know, you would have a source like, and actually this is a good, a good example of this is like a battery. A battery is not grounded right to a chassis or earth, right? It's just floating. And, and that can make a big difference. Sometimes you want to have, you know, your sensors floating and that's how you want to build your circuits. You don't want to have them ground. So be careful also when you're making connections. Sometimes you might ground something that shouldn't be ground and, um, and, and, um, that's important to uh, so thermocouples. Remember our uh, source, a floating source, also. Okay. Um, again, you may see these connections on DAC hardware too. And when and uh, talk about a differential measurement system, that's uh, actually got it has no no reference ground. But then there also may be a designation for a reference single ended or non reference uh, single ended. And those are all different types of, of uh, connections that you can have. Okay. So be aware of which ones, um, uh, which type of grounds you're using. Are you using a grounded or are you using a floating type ground? Okay. Okay, so the, pre the second pre-lab question really not a whole lot to discuss there. I've, I've given you some steps to follow. Uh, we could I could have asked you a lot of different kinds of pre-lab questions here about A to D conversion and so on. What I really want you to focus on before lab is to is to do a little practice with LabVIEW. And, and in the getting started tutorial that uh, was posted uh, on, on the course log, uh, there's a chapter four in there that has some steps in showing you how to um, experiment with um, using the DAC Assist and so on. And note that there's only certain pages that you have to go through, your pages four, one through four, six. Also, if you have not installed the NIDAC drivers then then you may not be able to do this you, you since you won't you won't necessarily have a DAC device uh, on your setup you have to simulate one and that's kind of a nice thing to be able to do but if you haven't installed the NIDAC drivers you which could take you a little bit of time then you might want to go do this on in the meter lab uh, and it's a short enough exercise where you could uh, do that uh, um, or you can install the NIDAC drivers but what you do is you simulate having a device and you can choose a lot of different types of devices I we used to use uh, this DAC device, so that's why I say choose this one, but you can use any DAC device and kind of experiment with it. So basically, um, using a simulated device, and this tutorial shows you how to build a simulated device, study pages 4.1 to 4.6, and build a little measure, you know, 
LabVIEW measurement uh, DAC uh, VI, and you're going to build something like that similar. You're going to build this VI, and there's four. There's actually five steps here, and, and, and on the course log, there's screenshots to show you what some of these look like. I won't necessarily go through those. And then you're going to build a little sample VI, and you're going to shoot shoot that by email to your TA. Uh, prior to lab, to show them that you've uh, gone through that exercise. Remember, you don't have a whole lot of time in the lab, so it helps if you've become familiar a little bit with with uh, how to build a DAC BI. And again, the TAs will still step you through uh, how, how to do it uh, in, in in a real setup. Okay, so that's your second pre lab. Okay, so getting close to finishing up here, we're gonna talk briefly about the modeling and um, simple design of the experiments that you're going to run this in this first week for this compound pendulum lab. If you go back and or you recall the uh, introduction to the course, we briefly discussed the compound pendulum model, but we derived this uh, second order, and this is a nonlinear ODE, as you recall, it has this sine theta term. And the J0 here is the mass moment of inertia of the pendulum, compound pendulum about the pivot. This M is the total mass. G is the gravitational acceleration. And L sub C is the distance from the pivot to the CG location. OK, so those, some of these are things, well, actually, you can theoretically, if, if I give you all of the geometric and material properties of the pendulum, which I will, and it's on the course log, then you can find this, you can parameterize this model, okay? So that's part of what we're gonna do in here. I show you, I give you the formula for that. J now here is actually the moment of inertia about the center of gravity, okay? So you're, you're gonna have to uh, revisit some of that as part of your pre-lab that's all I'll discuss shortly, okay? Now, when we built this model here, we assumed that one of the critical assumptions in this, the way it came out here, is that there was no other damping torques. But we know in looking at just that data that I showed you, and from just practic practically speaking, we know there's going to be friction. So this model is kind of idealistic, uh, but it can still serve some, some purposes for us. But a, an assumption made in the derivation of this model was that there was no damping torques, right? None of those friction effects that we were talking about earlier. If we make another assumption that it oscillates uh, with a small angle about about the uh, rest position, uh, and small for a pendulum is usually about 10 degrees. So let's say it's a small oscillation is less than 10 degrees. We can assume that the sine theta term is approximately theta, and that would make the uh, model equation look um, look like this form here and now it's linear in theta right we have a second order form it's got now these parameters further we can put this in what we'll call a standard second order ODE form if we divide by J naught here and define omega n here uh, as the square root of uh, MGLC divided by J naught right omega n in, when the equation is written in this form, there's a second order derivative here and you know the theta term, zero order derivative, if you'd like. The constant term here, we'd call that omega n squared, omega n being what you know is the undamped natural frequency. And this is something that you'll discuss much more in your 344 class as well, is, is, is solutions for this form of this equation and so on. But even without solving it, we know what this tells us. It's this undamped natural frequency. And remember, it's the natural frequency for an undamped system. So it's an approximation for our case. But still, it can be helpful if, it, if you make an assumption about light damping and so on. It tells us that, that that undamped natural frequency can be predicted if we have all of these parameters, right? So we have the mass, gravity, length to center gravity, uh, and the moment of inertia okay the neat thing about that is is we can measure or what we think is the un, close to the undamped natural frequency right uh, we can measure that frequency by measuring the, actually the period because we can remember we can measure uh, as I showed in a in a previous slide that that oscillation period so let's say we had an approximation of the undamped natural period and that that TN is that measured period is approximately 
related to this natural period. So we can estimate this omega sub n. If we can est estimate omega sub n, then we have, don't we, um, an estimate of, of J naught. So we have now two different ways that we can come up with J naught. Right? One is through a theoretical calculation, and one is through an experimental. Right? So um, one of the things that we're going to ask you to do in the lab is to, is to estimate this and see how close you get to the one that you uh, um, estimate from your calculations. Okay? And this is how you would experimentally determine the J naught. So I wanted you especially to see how the model, again, without even solving anything, just deriving it, is uh, one way of coming up with different experiments and different motivations for experiments, right? I don't have to solve any ODEs or anything to tell me that. If I just go in and I measure that natural period, understanding the assumptions I'm making, I can I can estimate that estimate that J naught gives me a sanity check on what I'm calculating, doesn't it? All right, so on the experimental side, you you can do a lot of experiments like this. So before closing, consider what can be found out by just using this real simple pendulum setup, simple sensor. Remember, the idea is you're setting up that sensor and you're making valid measurements. So you know that has to all be correctly calibrated and so on. So that's all part of the practice that you know we want to give you. And of course you're use, learning how to use DAC and, and to collect signals reliably, store them reliably, call them back and use them. So all of that is, is part of what we're trying to do, give you practice at. And here are some things you can do. You can estimate the pendulum moment of inertia, like I just said. But also you can you could some of the other experiments that we've done with the pendulum setup like this is you know you can show that for large oscillations that pendulum period actually depends on amplitude of oscillation, right? Uh, and that's uh, a, a known phenomenon with, for that nonlinear pendulum. As, as if it oscillates at a small period, then it's related to the uh, relation that we just saw. So if we let it start oscillating at higher amplitudes, it actually turns out that that period of oscillation depends on how large that amplitude is. And that's kind of a classical pendulum, nonlinear pendulum uh, study. And uh, the other thing you could do is just estimate the stored energy and study how the energy decreases each cycle. That's kind of a, a way to estimate how much uh, energy is being lost and we'll probably, you know, we will do that later uh, to try to estimate how much friction is in there, right? Because the frictional effects in the system is what's causing that loss of energy. And then you could also, as I said, estimate total energy over time. So those are some things that you could do. Any of these kind of motivates why you would want to analyze the signals and what kind of information you know, you'd want to get out of uh, the analysis of the data. So here's your pre-lab three. Um, in the lab, you're going to make period measurements to experimentally estimate the pendulum moment of inertia about the pivot based on a model of the pendulum, as I just showed. You'll need pendulum geometric data, which you can find on the course log, and use any of these values and update verify uh, them when you go to the lab. So I'm going to show you, you can see the table on the course log, but you should always double check those when you get to the lab. Uh, also, I don't know exactly what the, uh, you might double check also the density uh, of that aluminum. We don't know exactly what, which one that is, so uh, you might double check that as well, but use a nominal value for aluminum for that particular alloy that was used to make that pendulum. And here's several things that I want you to submit for this last pre-lab. One is, I just talked about some of the key assumptions that go into, into relating pendulum. This is mass moment of inertia, okay? There's a difference between, and this is a mistake that's sometimes made in this, you know, a lot of uh, students taking this course, it's been a while since you've done dynamics and you forget the difference between area mass moment, uh, sorry, area moment of inertia and mass moment of inertia. Here's an opportunity to to uh, go back and remind yourself, but that there is a difference. Um, so anyway, you're gonna, what were the assumptions made in relating pendulum mass moment of inertia to the untapped natural period? Um, that's uh, discussed uh, uh, shortly, uh, uh, just a while ago. Use the information on the geometric and material properties to determine L sub C, which is the distance to the center of gravity from the pivot, also the total mass of the pendulum, estimate those, and then finally the mass moment of inertia itself, right? You're going to get a theoretical value. Uh, in addition, um, 
I want you to calculate the theoretical undamped natural period in seconds. Once you have the uh, you know j sub zero and m and l c and g, you can estimate the natural period. The, once you know that, now you know what to expect when you go into the lab. It's not necessarily going to be exact, but it's going to be close. And the last uh, question here, I said, so you know, one factor in the uncertainty in your measurement of the measure period will depend on how many samples you have, right? How often should you sample? So. Let's say I wanted you to um, have no more than a one percent uncertainty in that period. You know, what, what given that your estimate of the undamped, given your estimate of the undamped period from your theoretical calculations, you know, what would you recommend for a sampling rate? Right? How fast should you sample so that you don't have more than one percent uncertainty? Okay. Something to think about. Okay, so now closing up, uh, just a couple of uh, points of advice here. Make notes uh, in your in your notebook about uh, how you're making all the power connections, sensor connections, and so on. This is something that you'll be able to use in case the pendulum lab is used in the final hands-on. Um, also, just a couple of other things. Keep separate issues of software from hardware. In other words, don't don't uh, confuse LabVIEW. Um, as as the instrument that measures signals. Remember, LabVIEW is the software that that controls the hardware. It's this hardware that is uh, doing the data collection. Similarly, when we start using LabVIEW for simulation, don't say LabVIEW is used to model the system. You're the one that does the modeling, and and LabVIEW helps you by providing a platform for solving those equations. Okay, just a um, sort of a terminology thing there. Uh, finally, in summary. Again, this, this is a lab that, that you can use uh, uh, to build your experience and comfort level with, with uh, using sensors, making proper connections, and so on. Um, we've purposely chosen a problem that's relatively easy to understand, provides a good review of some basic principles, all for the purposeful learning of using sensors and learning how to use data acquisition. So again, use, this, uh, use it as an opportunity to learn LabVIEW. That's what it's for. Um, and uh, also the, the experiment with the MyDeck, you know, uh, getting to learn how to use it. Uh, uh, I've had students in the past after 144 come and borrow a DAX for either uh, some of their senior design projects and so on. That was one of the purposes that we have these for. Um, and uh, it, it's not going to be appropriate for every problem you might have. Remember, it only has two channels of analog in. To, to out, uh, but uh, for a lot of the practical testing you might do for quick tests and so on, it's a very uh, nice little instrument for that purpose. Um, as you walk into the lab, you're going to be asked to think about what experiments, what data you're going to collect, and uh, you're going to be using this in follow-up uh, uh, follow week uh, for doing simulation, so carefully uh, take a look at that. Um, I'm going to um, quickly jump into the um, here you go um, in, 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 in the student exercises make sure that that uh, you think about these uh, things that we're asking you to do here um, uh, carefully read this I yeah I want you to capture and save at least three at least three different signals with initial conditions but also I, I in, in testing a, for example to estimate the pendulum mass moment of inertia remember the assumptions about that particular experiment that's something that you need to think about so the TAs will, may ask you about that you know why are you running that experiment which data set are you going to use to make that estimate again it's, it's an estimate and uh, be mindful of the assumptions made in the model that we use for that. Okay. So the data collected again in this week's experiment is going to be used. Um, that's all.